Well, hello, everybody. Greetings, and thanks for joining us. Uh, we're going to pray before we head into our time of worship. Uh, Lord, we thank you, uh, just as always, for the freedom and the opportunity to be able to um, to worship you. And, and we thank you that, um, that in our current situation, Lord, that we are not... Um, living in fear, Lord, but we're living in trust. We're living in faith. And um, I just pray that you would encourage our hearts um, today, that you would speak to us uh, through your word, that you'd speak to us through worship, that as we sing songs of praise to you, that you would um, be blessed and glorified, that you would minister to our hearts, that you would um, bring comfort where needed, that you would um, just ease fear where there is fear, that you would just help us to have joy in you, Lord. And we thank you for uh, just this ability to be able to sing to you, Lord, and to make music. And And so I just pray for um, each and every person who is uh, watching this uh, video right now, Lord, that they would truly be able to enter into your presence and to uh, be in your courts with praise, Lord. And so we just give you this time. We pray that you would be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen.
You're the only answer to the darkness You're the only right among the wrong You're the only hope among chaos You are the voice that calls me on Louder than every lie My sword in every fight The truth will chase away the night Cause your name is power Over darkness Freedom for the captives Mercy for the broken and the hopeless Your name is faithful In the battle glory In the struggle mighty You will let us down or fail us Cause your name is power No, it is written Hope is certain. I know that the word will never fail. I know that in every situation, yes, I know you speak the power to prevail. And louder than every lie, my sword in every fight, the truth will chase away. The night. Your name is power over darkness, freedom for the captive, mercy for the broken and the hopeless. Your name is faithful in the battle, glory in the struggle. Mighty, it won't let us down or fail us. Your name is power. speak you scatter darkness light arrives and heaven opens holy spirit let us hear it when you speak the church awakens we believe that change is coming holy spirit let us see it when you speak you scatter darkness light arrives and heaven opens Holy Spirit, let us hear it. When you speak, the church awakens. We believe that change is coming. Holy Spirit, let us see it. Because your name is power over darkness, freedom for the captives, mercy for the broken and the whole. Your name is faithful in the battle, glory in the struggle. Mighty, it won't let us down or fail us. Cause your name is power.
So I fall down, fall down at the feet of him who gives me mercy. Mercy is blood, the only thing that saves me. The only thing that saves me. Oh, I will make a way. The king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from. Oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life. Oh, he is my song.
Yes, you are good, oh, good. Oh, you are good, good. Oh, you're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. Never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. Straight highway, a path for the Lord. Jesus is coming soon. Call back the sinner, wake up the saint. Let every nation shout of your fame. Jesus is coming. Like a bride waiting for a groom, we'll be a church ready for you. Every heart longing for a king, we sing, even so come, Lord Jesus, come, even so come, Lord Jesus. justice, all will be new, your name forever, faithful and true, oh Jesus is coming soon, like a bride waiting for a groom, we'll be a church ready for you. Jesus, come, even so come, Lord Jesus, come. So we wait, we wait for you, God, we wait, your 
do wait for you. Lord, we long for you. And as we see uh, just all the things that are happening in the world around us, Lord, it doesn't, it doesn't make us fear for the future. It makes us long for you. Lord, I pray that you would come for your church soon, that as we wait for you, that you would help us to be about your business, that you would help us to be reaching out to the people around us who don't know you, Lord. And, and Lord, we know that uh, I know that we feel limited in what we can do right now with all the distancing, but at the same time, we know that you provide opportunities and that your word does not return void and that the harvest is, is white and ready, God. And so we just pray that you would help each and every one of us to be waiting for you, to be longing for you, to be trusting in you, to be working for you and just sharing your love with others. And um, we just pray now that by your spirit that you would uh, speak through Pastor Brett, that you would give him your words to say to everyone, to encourage our hearts, to exhort us, to uh, just bring us closer to you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks to the worship team. It's a blessing to be able to worship in this new fashion. <laughs> Anyways, bloopers are happening all around me. It's, uh, it's a blessing to worship the Lord together. It's uh, good to come and be with you this way. As uh, Jen mentioned, even though we're limited, we're uh, able to gather together like this, and I think God can do some unique things. Uh, through this, through the videos, uh, encourage you to uh, make an effort to share and, and make comment as well. Let us know you're watching. Let us know uh, if you have needs. Uh, send us your prayer request. Um, connect and interact, interact with one another. I uh, encourage you to do that. I want to run through some uh, announcements. Some of these are, are uh, the typical announcements we've been doing during this time. And uh, I just want to remind you and and uh, re-communicate these things. First of all, your giving. Thank you for your faithfulness in giving and uh, encourage you to keep that up and, and uh, as much as you're able. Don't want to pressure you. I know a lot of people's uh, work situations have shifted and changed. Uh, so as the Lord has allowed, the Lord has blessed you. Uh, I encourage you to uh, do what you can to be faithful in your giving and uh, uh, let's minister to one another as well. If you have needs, again, let us know. Uh, let us know what to be praying for and, uh, and um, connect with us. Uh, there's social media op opportunities for you. You know, we're on Facebook, we're on Instagram, and we're posting things to encourage you. We also, as you know from watching this, we have a YouTube channel now, 
And uh, not only are we uh, broadcasting and archiving the services so you can watch, but also share and, th and, and send that out to others, uh, but also uh, some of the people on staff have been adding some devotions, some encouragements, um, uh, just opportunities for you to, to watch and, and be blessed and connect with uh, others. Uh, uh, it's, it's been really encouraging to see some of the things that have been posted. So I encourage you to check out our YouTube channel, subscribe to it. Uh, and then turn on notifications, and it'll let you know when new videos are out and uh, have arrived. Uh, so I encourage you to do that. Turn on your notifications on YouTube and uh, watch the videos, share them, uh, and uh, be encouraged. Uh, also, we have our church app, and we're uh, able to, with our church app, we're able to send out announcements. Uh, so we're doing that pretty much on a weekly basis, and, and then additionally throughout the week as we have need. So on your app, when you download the app on your phone, uh, you can um, turn on the notifications and the settings and uh, you know, at least once a week, but occasionally a bit more, we'll send out announcements, remind you of some of the things that are going on and uh, ways to connect. One of the things that we announced is all the home fellowships uh, that are doing uh, Zoom Bible studies through the Zoom app. Uh, it's a conference call app and they're able to join together like that. Uh, so some of the home fellowships are doing that. Some of the ladies Bible studies, men's Bible studies are doing that. Uh, the Heavens Bible Study on, on Sunday morning is doing that. Uh, so opportunities to connect like that, we have uh, that listed on our website. Uh, so you can go to the, the page there. We announce that through our app as well. The Marriage Fellowship that uh, meets on a monthly basis, they're going to be doing their fellowship through Zoom this month. And if you're interested, we'll have the information online. Uh, and you can connect uh, with the Negris on that and uh, be a part of the Marriage Fellowship. So I encourage you to do that. That's coming up. Uh, what's the date on that? That's April the 10th, uh, and it's at 6.30. That's Friday evening, 6.30, uh, April the 10th, and the Negris are hosting that. So if you want to be a part of the Marriage Fellowship on Friday night coming up, uh, you can um, uh, check our website, uh, the announcements page, and there'll be information about the Negris uh, Marriage Fellowship uh, to encourage you and so you can connect. Let's see. Also, I want to mention, we uh, put this on our, our social media and want to remind you if you saw this, uh, if not, I uh, want you to consider connecting with us. You know, this, this week coming up is uh, not only Holy Week or Passion, the Week of Passion, um, uh, but it's also Passover coming up. And so the uh, opportunities with both, and it's, it's a blessing to see them connected. Uh, as you consider the Passover, the Seder opportunities that we've had in the past and how you can see Jesus in the Seder. Uh, I want to encourage you, the Jews, Jews for Jesus organization uh, is, is hosting an online Seder, uh, Christ in the Passover. Uh, so I want to encourage you, we put this link on our webpage and so forth. There's uh, multiple opportunities to connect and watch this uh, online. Uh, they're live casting on Sunday, on Tuesday, on Thursday, and on Friday. And during those, on those days, multiple uh, opportunities to connect throughout the day. Uh, so you might want to consider that. Uh, it's so important for us to understand the Passover and how Jesus in his ministry fulfilled the Passover. Uh, and uh, to walk through the Seder uh, together, to walk through that meal together and see Christ in the Seder, it's such a blessing. Uh, the website, again, it's on our website. You can check it, but just to let you know, the website is JewsForJesus.org. And that's all spelled out. That's uh, Jews for, not the number, but Jews for Jesus, F O R, uh, dot org, and then slash Christ. And this is hard. Right, ready? Christ dash in dash the dash Passover dash online. Uh, and again, that will be on our website. But just to let you know, I think it's a great opportunity uh, to enjoy uh, their insight on Christ in the Seder, uh, Christ in the Passover. Uh, so opportunity for you to connect with that. Um, some updates on what we've been doing. Uh, you know, today we had the half day of prayer. And some of you were able to connect with me on that. Uh, it, it was a prayer on your own with the Lord. But we uh, had a video instructing you on how to do that and the, the uh, format that we were taking and ways that you could walk through a half day of prayer. And I saw a lot of communication online, uh, people uh, emailing back and forth and so forth. So. Uh, if you did that, uh, thank you. I think it was encouraging. I'd love to hear your story. So if you can send emails, uh, let me know, testimonies. Share with one another as well. Um, I I'll share with you. I got up extra early so I could do it um, and, and um, you know, be able to do that before 
I got up at like five and, and, and I did it early so that I could do it while you guys were doing your half day of prayer. I was praying for you and your half day of prayer. Uh, and I just want to tell you how, what a sweet time I had with the Lord. Uh, clearly the things he spoke, uh, direction, and occur, uh, encouragement and assurance and scripture that I had, had not considered and insight. And that was just such a blessing. Uh, we'll put for the further information online about the half day of prayer and encourage you to do that on your own. Schedule it on your own. Uh, this week, uh, I'm going to try to get some uh, directed prayer. Uh, so we'll direct you in prayer this week if you're open to that, if you want to do that. Just some things to be praying about specifically. And we'll give you, I'll, I'll send that out uh, through the prayer chain. I'll send that, I'll put an announcement. You'll get an announcement on this eventually. Uh, hopefully we'll have it by Monday. Uh, and just, you know, things to specifically be praying for each day coming up this week. Not only because it's, it's a need in, in our lives, but it's, it is uh, the week leading into the resurrection. Uh, it's a time for us to focus and give attention to those things. So we want to give uh, you an encouragement and opportunities to pray uh, and seek the Lord on that. So we'll do that this week. I also want to mention, too, uh, maybe you had forgotten or you wondered, maybe you were wondering about the Easter baskets. We announced this as well, but the Easter baskets were... Uh, under quarantine, and now they've been picked up. So now they're picked up, and, and they've been delivered. Uh, they are uh, going to be under quarantine on location for a bit uh, to make sure everything's kosher and cool with that, and they're clean. Uh, and then they're going to be delivered to uh, uh, the residents over at Harbor Chase, uh, uh, and we're excited about that. So, uh, you know, with all the chaos of this quarantine, you might have forgotten that. Your uh, Easter baskets being given to the nursing home residents is going to be a real blessing and a real ministry, especially during this time. What an encouragement uh, during this time that will be. Uh, and we didn't know that, packing them and getting them ready, but the Lord knew, and he had you involved with that. So thanks for doing that, and uh, we're going to continue to pray and seek the Lord and see how we can uh, continue to minister uh, and be creative. Uh, so watch for those opportunities and pray for them yourself. Pray for creative opportunities uh, to be a light, to be a help, to be uh, sharing the gospel, sharing the love of Christ uh, in this time. All right. Well, let's turn to 2 Timothy. You know, as, I, uh, as we turn to 2 Timothy, I want to encourage you as well. I'm going to, I was a, I wrote a, a blog post on our website so you can connect on our app or our, or our, our uh, webpage to catch this. Uh, you might see it posted on social media as well. Uh, so we have a blog post out there, but I'm going to write another blog post about just my experience with the half day of prayer, uh, just going through that, some of the things the Lord spoke to me personally, and, and uh, just encourage you with that. So if you're interested in that, you can watch for uh, a new fresh blog post. I'm telling you that to hold myself accountable, so I actually do write it uh, and post that, uh, and pray that you're encouraged by it. Uh, I know some of you like to uh, like those, like the blog post, like to read those things. Others of you could care less. That's fine. Either way, I just want to be a blessing to those who want uh, to be encouraged. All right, 2 Timothy uh, chapter uh, 2 is where we're going to be today, but I want to back up and uh, begin our time in uh, chapter 1. So as you look at chapter 1 of 2 Timothy, I want to remind you of the, the uh, setting, the scene, the context, where Paul is at, uh, what he's going through. Paul is in uh, the deep, dark dungeon experience of Rome. It's... Uh, uh, it's uh, a heavy place. It is a place where people uh, are sent to die. It is a place where uh, they are sent, to, and many of them would die in the prison, and those that didn't die in the prison often would be taken right to the executioner's acts. Uh, Paul experienced that, right? So as you note this, the, the Paul's in that situation. This is considered by most commentators as his last book, the, you know, kind of his last passionate words, uh, important uh, emotional uh, words to Timothy. Uh, it's it's a, in that place that we're surprised uh, that this isn't such a dark book. We're surprised that this isn't, uh, you know, Paul uh, moaning and groaning. Instead, uh, Paul is encouraging and promising, and, and he has his hope in the Lord. And it's just a refreshing book, especially in the season that we're in. Uh, as you look at 2 Timothy, the things that uh, relate to us right now. The, the, Paul is more isolated <laughs> in this writing. He's more isolated than he's ever been. And Paul's a people person. You know, Paul 
always is writing to people and always connecting and talking about the relationships he's had and the people that are important to him and the brothers in Christ and the ministry and all those things. And he's always written about that. And yet in this letter, we know and he uh, lets us know that he's alone. And he's isolated and all the pain and all the frustration of that. And there's just a way for us in this, uh, this season and what we're going through that we can connect uh, and it relate to Paul. He's in a much harsher situation than we are, but there's a sense that we can understand him, and uh, he gives us insight. And uh, it's just a, uh, such an important, relevant book uh, for us in this season. Uh, as you come to this, uh, Paul here opens this up, and uh, in chapter 1, verse 4, uh, he says this, greatly desiring to see you, <laughs> uh, that I may be filled with joy. You know, that Paul's heart here uh, of fellowship, right? Here he is in a place where he can't see Timothy. Uh, the only one that's with him is Luke. Uh, everybody else has left him uh, for all different reasons. And, uh, Timothy can't get to him, not rapidly, not in that culture, not in that time of technology and uh, lack of technology. Uh, Timothy's separated from him. Paul's alone. And Paul says in this moment of isolation, how I long to see you. You know, in the past, we've read over that, and God, you know, didn't even really consider it. It wasn't like it had much of a, I mean, there was ways we could talk about maybe a, a family member that's been gone for a while or, you know, things like that. But it was, it was always a bit of a stretch for us, and we, I've often read that and kind of just glossed over that and not considered it. But now, because of what we're, because I'm doing this in video, and I'm entering your house through a sanitized uh, video here. Now I read that and I go, how I long to see you. And it isn't it just the Lord, right, to have us here reading that and recognizing, you know, as you read through this book, uh, Paul is alone, Paul is isolated, but Luke's with him. <laughs> and even at the end of this book, we hear Paul say, Jesus came and stood with him. I'm just amazed at that, you know, this... This, the fellowship that we have, you know, what, today in that half day of prayer, um, you know, being alone, right? It was a time of solitude, which right now isn't that difficult to, to accomplish. <laughs> but I'm, you know, taking a walk and I'm walking through my neighborhood and, you know, there's a few highs and hellos to dog walkers and a few neighbors and stuff, but pretty much alone walking that. And yet I was not alone. You know, I'm, just experiencing the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, uh, the present nature of the Lord, his proximity, his words, how he was speaking to my heart. It was rich. He was so close. And, you know, you read this and you recognize there is that sense of the struggle of isolation, but in, in the midst of that, maybe even accomplished because of the isolation, because I'm not uh, experiencing the overwhelming you know, uh, interaction and all the uh, people that I see and talk to, whether it's, uh, you know, subtle things like just, you know, dealing with a cashier or, or whether it's personal friends or conversations, all of that's kind of been stripped away. And, and, and now in this moment, it's like in the quietness of this moment, the Lord's speaking and I recognize he's, he's been speaking. <laughs> and, 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 but just that isolation kind of brings you to that place where you uh, and you sense it in Paul, uh, that isolation brings you to that place where you appreciate fellowship all the more, and you appreciate, you long for the believers to see them, to be with them. You long for the, the fellowship, the body of Christ, the unity, uh, but you're so blessed by the uh, omnipresent Lord. He's always with us. He never leaves us nor forsakes us. Now, just a side note here. I know we often bring up the verse where two or three are gathered together. Uh, there he is in the midst of them. And I understand that, and I'm gracious and okay with that. But we so often take that out of context. Uh, be careful with that. That in context is talking about in moments where there's church issues, church discipline, a need for reconciliation. God is in that, and he's showing his approval, and he's showing his presence, his approval for that reconciliation. That's the sense of his presence where two or three are gathered. It's in that context 
Because when we say that where two or three are gathered, we so often imply it's only when there's two or three. Then there's a quorum or something and God shows up. Or, and and there, when you're all alone, it's like, well, I don't know. <laughs> Is he here? I don't have two others. You know? No, listen, he never leaves you nor forsakes you. You're never alone, ever alone. He's constantly present with us. You're never isolated from God. So uh, to see the richness of that in the midst of this passage and to relate to Paul, so important for us, right? And and isn't it amazing how the word of God comes to life in the seasons of life and the uh, the experiences of life and what we are are going through even right now, how relevant, uh, how uh, personal, uh, and how amazing that the Lord would put us here, working our way through the Bible, you know, step by step, and I admit I take a long time. Uh, I plot our way through, and as we kind of crawl through it, isn't it amazing how fitting passages are for the moment? We couldn't have planned that. But here again, just to join with the sentiment, the sincere heart of Paul here to, to express it to you, to acknowledge this feeling of isolation, and to let you know how we are feeling and to, and to know that you feel the same likely. Uh, to hear Paul say, greatly, verse 4, greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with awe, with joy. You, you, you just hear the sentiment of that and you just say, yes, I, yeah, I'm there. right? But at the same time, recognizing the presence of the Lord. Right? Uh, to know right now that as you watch this, wherever you're watching this, that the Lord has entered in, right? Uh, and that it, it's much more than just a video broadcast. Right? It's much more than just a stream across the internet. Uh, it, there is a connection uh, uh, that we have together as the body of Christ with worldwide uh, throughout the timeline of history. The body of Christ our, Christ, our hearts are knit together. We are being built together and the presence of the Lord has entered in. Right? The presence of the Lord is there where you're at right now. He's with me. He's with you. Uh, uh, what a rich experience of his scripture. Right? So pertinent, so present, so relevant, so needed. Uh, even in this moment. So let's take that to prayer. Would you just invite the work of the Holy Spirit? And would you just um, uh, kindle, rekindle that uh, hunger and thirst for fellowship? Don't dumb that down or don't uh, numb that down. Uh, but let's know that the Lord soon, we're going <laughs> we're gonna to reunite. Whether it's here, there, or in the air, one way or another, uh, we're going to reunite. So Uh, Let's put our hope and excitement in that. Like Paul, uh, let's join uh, with appreciation of fellowship with the Lord and with each other. Uh, So would you pray? Would you ask the Lord to speak to you and meet with you as this study continues? I'll give you a moment to do that. we thank you uh, that you're present. We thank you that you don't leave us as orphans. None of us are alone. Lord, even if we're sitting before the screen and nobody else is in the room, you're with us. Your Holy Spirit fills us. You indwell us. You speak to us directly. You know us better than anyone, Lord. You you know the depth of our need, the core of our heart. Lord, you uh, minister to us. We're your sheep and you're the shepherd, Lord. You uh, care for the flock. Even right now, I know this, that Christ is washing his bride, the church, with the water of his word. He's uh, washing us to cleanse us, to purify us, uh, to present us spotless without stain or wrinkle. Uh, Lord, that's happening right now. Right now in the midst of this struggle, we know that you're actively at work discipling us, building us up, or building in us endurance, building in us perseverance, building in us uh, patience, uh, Lord, building in us character, uh, maturing us, moving us further into our faith, growing us up, equipping us, 
establishing these things in us. Lord, you're, you're the one that builds the church, and that hasn't stopped. Even though that we're separated like this in the moment, Lord, your hands have not been uh, held back. You are at work in this. And even right now, I know this, that by the work of your Holy Spirit, through your word, through the, uh, the love of Christ, you're accomplished these things, and you're building in us hope. Lord, pour out your love in abundance on your church, Lord, for this fellowship, but your church worldwide. Lord, let the church experience your work and be so sensitive, so aware of the, the, the continuing work, uh, the continuing sanctifying work of your Holy Spirit. Uh, Lord, and let that give birth to hope in our hearts. Lord, as we turn to your word, Lord, counsel us, uh, encourage us, uh, Lord, challenge us, correct us. Lord, mold us and shape us. Accomplish these things that we've even prayed about. Uh, Lord, stir your work through your word by your Holy Spirit in the hearts watching this. Lord, in the hearts of our fellowship. Uh, Lord, we, we give you this time and we so trust you. Lord, we're so, we're so sure that you're going to do You want this more than we do. So we're just surrendering to your work and we're so confident uh, that you're accomplishing these things. Lord, bless the people. Encourage your bride. Lord, reach the hurting, the broken, the distraught, Lord, the, the doubting, the skeptic, the worrisome, the, the anxious one, the fearful one. Lord, reach them with your love. Comfort them with your presence, with your fellowship. Uh, Lord, reach the lost. Those who haven't said yes, soften their hearts and open their hearts to your love. Uh, Lord, give them the heart of humility to surrender to you. Uh, Lord, do that work. Let there be revival in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let, as we turn in this book of 2 Timothy, let's go to chapter 2. We're stepping through this book again, and as we step through this book, uh, we want to note the heart of Paul in this. In chapter 2, uh, Lord uh, willing, Lord permitting, we're going to read through this and, and cover it through verse 13. Uh, and in this, Paul gives us three analogies, three examples that he uses, a parable-like. Paul uh, uses the image and the idea of a soldier, uh, he uses the idea of an athlete, and then he uses the idea of a farmer. And all the ways that, that these examples, these analogies speak to us in spiritual sense, uh, in our faith. And there's really this, uh, this call through these examples and all these different kind of uh, angles that we're looking at it, the, the different perspectives that these analogies give, the, the examples give. There's a way that they all come together and they gel in this, this call uh, to uh, commitment, right? In the sense of, uh, for the believer to focus and to uh, commit your heart to the Lord. It, it strongly, passionately, in a real sense, uh, uh, just with an attitude of, you know, uh, not looking back. You know, you put your hand to the plow and you're not looking back. Uh, we're, we're going toward the Lord. We're growing toward him. You know, that, uh, that sense of these things uh, as uh, we seek the Lord as we follow him. It doesn't matter what anybody else is doing. We're going to have the heart of a soldier, the heart of an athlete, the heart of a farmer. Uh, that's going to be our attitude. There's a real uh, call to a purifying, you know, in a sense like kind of like burning the bridges that are behind us and just moving forward. There's no retreat. Uh, there's no going back. Uh, we're moving forward in this. And we've been talking about this. Uh, you know, there's this this call to uh, build our lives upon the rock of Christ. Uh, throughout Scripture, in fact, throughout history, God has used things like a, the pandemic that we're facing, the pestilences. He's used things like that uh, as a wake-up call, uh, a call to sanctify, a call to purify, a call to recommit, a call to uh, you know take account of your life and really look at your life in that sense of, you know, who am I living for? What, what is it that I'm seeking after? And, and so often we need to take inventory like that. Uh, the ministry of Christ in, uh, in the New Testament, the Gospels, uh, his, his favorite message to preach, the, the, the most common topic that he covered was this, repent. <laughs> and John the Baptist, his forerunner, the one that prepared the way, same thing, Repent. Uh, there's this call for us to recognize, listen, uh, we, we cannot just look to Christianity to be uh, this 
soft, cozy, you know, presenting this idea. If you, if you do these things right, God's going to bless you and make your life easy in a rosy bed, rose bed of uh, 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 tiptoe through the tulips, and uh, you're going to be rich and blessed and all that. You know, we've presented so often in the church, the church has presented Christianity like that. Uh, listen, we're not called to that. Are you living for that? Listen, we're living for Christ. And we need nothing else. And the, the, just the sheer examples here of these that are given, uh, the fact that he uses a soldier, the fact that he uses an athlete, the fact that he uses a farmer, uh, the, the, the notions here, especially in this culture, of Paul's culture, uh, none of those people are living cushy lives. Those people are living lives of self-sacrifice, uh, of difficulties, of hardships. Uh, the, the, the image is given here uh, is for us as Christians to stop and to really consider, uh, listen, uh, if I have uh, uh, come to God and asked him for uh, an easier life, for a, a happy life, uh, <laughs> uh, Paul's calling you to the table and he's saying, listen, maybe you need to reevaluate. That's not why we're here. And that's not why Jesus came. The, 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 the sense of these things, there's this real call to repentance. I use the uh, parable of Jesus uh, from the Sermon on the Mount where he talks about building your house upon the rock versus building your house on the sand. The person that builds their house on the rock is the person that has heard the words of Christ and done them. They do them. They're doers of the word. Uh, their lives have, have been directed, uh, changed, transformed. They're following Jesus. Uh, that's the person that builds their house on the rock. The person that builds their house on the sand, obviously they could have heard the words, but that didn't affect them, didn't change any decisions in their life, didn't change any patterns in their life. Uh, they may have been familiar with Jesus, but that didn't uh, transform anything about them. That is a person that builds their house on the sand. And, and the thing that happens, I think, is sometimes we uh, try to mix and build a little bit on the rock, a little bit on the sand. Listen, Christian, now's the time to let the sand get washed away and build your house on the rock. When the storm comes, the sand will wash away. But the rock, the house built upon the rock, it will stand. That's what we want to build our house on, build our lives upon, is doing, uh, following Jesus, uh, being a person that's obedient to Christ. Uh, that's the call of, this, uh, of Paul here as well. And so, you know, even as we begin this chapter, there's just a real sense that I have this constant uh, uh, encouragement from the Lord, especially in this season, Call the church to repentance. <laughs> I, I think this is one of the things that God does in moments like this. That he uses these moments of challenge, of pandemic, of fear. He uses these moments and it really, really is. It's a come to Jesus moment. It's an opportunity for you to really evaluate your life. Invite the Holy Spirit to search your heart. What is it you're relying on? Where are you going for satisfaction? What are you pursuing? Listen, it is a time for the church to repent. And I think that's a place. The revival begins with us, right? Repentance begins with us. Uh, it personally and individually, first and foremost, I think that each one of us, and myself included today in the half day of prayer, one of the time, part of the uh, time, uh, one of the efforts that consumed my time was repentance. Just asking the Lord, and all kinds of things that were coming to mind of apathy and, and satisfaction and, and expectations that I've uh, assumed upon the Lord and just repenting of those things. Uh, so individually, I want to call you to repentance. Uh, ask the Lord. Don't depend on your own effort, but ask the Lord to forgive you. Ask him to wash you and cleanse you and begin ask him uh, to, to just uh, put a passion in your heart to follow him. Right, and, and, and then as we as the church, I think as the church as a whole, we need to ask him to forgive us for the sins of the church. Uh, the church has uh, begun to rationalize and permit issues that God would call abomination, uh, things of sin, uh, things the scripture describes as uh, condemning sins, uh, and we've acted like it's okay, we've preached a false gospel, uh, the church as a whole has promoted things that are, are not promoted in the Bible uh, on every gamut of the church, whether it's you know, what we would call the liberal portion of the church or the Pentecostal part of the church or the conservative part of the church or you know, whatever denomination and all those kind of things. Uh, that you look at the church as a whole, and there are things that we need to ask the Lord to forgive us as the church. 
and, and I might not have my hands directly involved in some of those issues, uh, but to know that those that proclaim themselves to be believers in Christ, permitting and promoting abortion, I need to repent, Lord. And on, on my watch, that's happened. I need, I'm asking the Lord, would you forgive the church for these things? I'm asking the Lord to revive the church. I'm asking the Lord to bring conviction upon the church uh, as a whole, on pastors, on people. And, and if pastors won't respond, if leadership won't respond, that the people would leave. Uh, that, that healthy people would begin to say, you know what, we need to go where the word's being taught. Uh, I'm praying that God purifies the church. I'm asking the Lord, and I'm putting myself as part of the church, and I'm saying, Lord, forgive us for what we've painted and allowed, the, the ways that we've reflected you, the, the image that we've painted of the gospel, the, the things that you've said are sinful, that you died for, and we're acting like, no, now it's okay. Forgive us. We're lying to the people, and we're promising them a false gospel. We're giving them a false hope in things that will damn them. Lord, forgive us. So can I ask you, as part of the church, this is heavy on my heart, would you repent not only of your own sin? Would you ask the Lord not only to purify your life and, and really begin to commit your life to the Lord, but for the church as a whole? Would you begin to confess the sin of the church and begin to ask the Lord for revival in the church? And then I think we have to pray for our nation. And listen, I, I, I could have a whole series of messages on this. Listen, America is not the promised land. America is not the chosen people. There are a lot of ways that we uh, uh, have taught that and uh, the churches around it, and we want to be cautious with that. There is only one nation that God has a covenant with, and it's Israel. Uh, so be careful with this. Uh, but I do think it's right and good for us to ask the Lord to forgive our land, to forgive the people, our nation, uh, to uh, name the sins of our nation, uh, the things that we've allowed and permitted and asked the Lord to forgive us. Nehemiah, when he prayed for his people, uh, the Israelites, he prayed and he confessed the sins of the people. Uh, and he put himself there in the midst of that and asked the Lord to forgive him. And I think we can do that. And we can ask the Lord to, to forgive our land uh, and, and pray for re revival. But listen, the world needs that right now. Uh, Pastor Jim and I, just a moment ago, talking about these things. Uh, this may very, be, may very well be a last call. This might be a last wave of a, a, a gracious invite for revival uh, and church. Uh, this is a call to action. If there were, you know, the things that we are able to do in this hindered moment of isolation, we can pray, and that is powerful and effective. The fervent prayer of the righteous matters. It makes a difference. It is one of the most, the most powerful things we can do. Uh, so in this moment, do not feel hindered or isolated. Recognize that in these times, especially with Paul, this, the times where he's hindered and isolated in the practical sense uh, were the most powerful minutes of ministry for him. Uh, may it be so for us. Be powerfully giving yourself to prayer. The church marches the strongest when they're on their knees. We, when we choose to pray, uh, we are the most powerful army that's ever existed. Pray. Ask the Lord to forgive us, each of us, personally, individually, the church as a whole. Ask the Lord to forgive the nation, even the world. Let's pray for revival. It's needed in our time. Um, I want to pause right there and uh, just sense that it would be good to pray right there in this. If you're not a believer in Christ, if you've been playing games, if you've been a church attender, or you've been trusting your mom or dad or your grandparents uh, for your faith, if you thought you were a Christian because you're an American, if you've never surrendered to Christ, if you never confessed your uh, selfishness, your rebellion, your sin, if you've never confessed uh, your own personal issue uh, uh, of uh, uh, rebellion toward the Lord, you need to do that. And you need to ask the Lord to forgive you because he's done that work. He can rescue you not only from the issues of sin, but from the coming judgment, the righteous wrath of God that the sinner deserves. Christ stood in your place. Ask him to forgive you. He paid the price. He took your punishment. What is headed your way as a sinner, the judgment that's coming your way, he stood in your place. And he took your place and he let your sin be placed on it. He nailed it to the cross. You need to ask him to forgive you. You need to trust 
the work of Christ on the cross. And as he did that, he rose again and he makes a way for us to enter into the presence of God. His sacrifice was received. The resurrection is proof of that. The empty tomb is proof of that. And as you consider that, now we have hope in heaven, not in this world. So now's the time for you personally to pray and make that commitment. Now's the time for the church to call the Lord to forgive us and that we would fresh and new ask to sanctify us and purify us and forgive us. Now's the time to repent. Let's pray for the church as a whole. Let's pray for our nation. Let's pray for this world. Let's pray for revival to rush through this world and let us, uh, let's pray God's grace. Let's pray that we see more people saved than ever before in history. Let's pray for that. I, I think it may very well be a last call. Uh, so let's take a moment to pray. Uh, you do that. And, and let's invite the Lord to stir our hearts with these things that we continue to do this uh, in the days to come. Uh, so would you ask the Lord right now to search your heart? If you need to make a commitment for salvation that you've never done, do it now. Uh, if you need help in that, contact us. Uh, and we have information on our website as well. Uh, contact us about the issues of being saved, getting saved, your salvation in Christ. Uh, let us know. Uh, we can encourage you and help you in that. Believers, uh, recommit to these things. Well, I'm going to give you a moment to pray in the midst of our Bible study, and then we'll jump back into 2 Timothy in just a moment. You pray. Holy Spirit, we know from your word one of the effective things that you do is you convict the world of sin. Well, we're praying for a fresh sensitivity, conviction on the heart of each one of us that are praying upon our church, upon the church worldwide, upon our nation, the people worldwide, that there would be a fresh sensitivity to conviction, that we would be embarrassed and ashamed of our sin, Lord, recognizing the offense that it is to you, Lord. Let there just be a, a, a real, a, a new, brand new experience of that. There's so many hearts that are callous, and uh, Lord, in so many ways we've ignored and stubbornly built up a resistance. Lord, remove that. Lord, we have a, a, a way of approaching this that is not the typical warfare. Lord, we have the weapons of warfare that are far different. Lord, you've given us prayer, and we come in the name of Jesus, and we ask you, Lord, for our family members, for the prodigals, for the people around us, for uh, people within the church uh, that need to repent. Lord, the church itself, Lord, we're asking you to pull down strongholds, to demolish those things. Lord, Lord the high arguments, the, uh, the rationalizations, Lord, we come against that in the name of Jesus, and we pray for a, a heart of repentance uh, to be... Uh, born in uh, people all around us, within the church, outside of the church, Lord, around the world, in this nation, Lord, in the leadership of this nation, uh, in, in uh, Lord, those that have much and those that have little, Lord, let there be a wave of revival and salvation. Lord, we're praying that you would add to the church. Lord, we know your heart of compassion. We know how far you would go to reach us, and we're just joining your, your passionate work Lord, we're crying out for these things. Lord, search our hearts. Let revival begin. Let repentance begin right here in the heart of the church. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, now, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, we'll jump into the text. and uh, Verse 1 says, You therefore, my son, you, Timothy, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Be strong in the grace. You just stop and you recognize here, this, this strength that's being mentioned here, um, there is no strength that matches this. There's nothing that comes close to this. This grace, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. 
There is nothing like this in all the world. There's no army, there's no weapon, uh, there's no superhero. There's nobody, no one's even imagined things like this. Uh, but the reality is, is that when we surrender, when we put our complete uh, uh, trust in the Lord, uh, when we rely on the work of Christ, there is no strength like this in, in, in anywhere in the universe. Uh, this encouragement to us, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Just repeat that, ruminate on that, marinate in that. Just hear this encouragement. Uh, yes, from Paul in a difficult place, uh, but the hope of that in the midst of the, his imprisonment, what he faces for him to say this, and for Timothy, uh, you know, we say a young man, but at this point he's 40, uh, as he hears these kind of words from Paul, uh, these words are... Uh, they're not shallow, they're not trite. In fact, we haven't dealt with this appropriately in our faith. We haven't considered this, and you need to consider this. We need to uh, let this just repeat in our mind. Invite the Holy Spirit to counsel you in this, and stop and hear this uh, fresh and new. Ask for a sensitive heart in this. Uh, this encouragement to you, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Just amazing to hear that. At verse 2, continuing and adding to that thing, in the things that you've heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who are able to teach others also. Now, this has been, for us as a Calvary Chapel, this has been uh, kind of our, our uh, mission statement or our strategy for ministry. Uh, and and uh, to take this and just to... Uh, communicate it to you and to insert it into uh, our mindset as a fellowship personally here at Calvary Palm Harbor. Uh, this is our mindset. We want to teach you the word and we're asking for the Holy Spirit to be your counselor, your teacher in this. We're asking for the Holy Spirit to deepen the roots of your understanding. Uh, the prayers that Paul would pray to the Colossians, to the Ephesians, that he would illuminate, the Holy Spirit would illuminate you, that he would give you a spirit of wisdom and knowledge, of revelation, uh, that the, the, the Lord would disciple you. We're asking for that to happen. We're putting our trust in the work of the Holy Spirit through the word of God. We will elevate that. We will depend on that. We will commit to that. Like We set our heart on that. We won't let go of that. Uh, that's why we don't do a lot of flashy uh, you know, campaigns or pushes or or you know, church growth things or the, those kind of, because uh, we are simply wanting to groom this attitude in you. We have the word of God, and that is more than enough. We are trusting for the strength of God's grace through Jesus Christ in you to bring the word of God to fruit in your life. And that as we do that, that the Holy Spirit uh, building up in you, developing in you, um, uh, bringing harvest in your life, the Holy Spirit cultivating and, and sanctifying, discipling you, equipping you, raising you up, the things that the Holy Spirit puts on your heart, that you begin to step into those things of ministry. This is a call to action for the church. And it's not that we would depend on a motivational speech or the, uh, the snazzy nature of our presentations. I just said snazzy. I didn't... <laughs> Let's start over. Anyways... <laughs> We're not depending on those things. Here's what I could, I know that some of the historically some of the strongest revivals have begun with a sermon that was monotone, long, you know, just hard to live, and yet the Holy Spirit grabbed the hearts of the people and God began to move. So it's not the dynamics of the pulpit, it's the move of the Holy Spirit. And so what we're relying on is the Word of God, the Holy Spirit taking the Word of God in your lives and developing in you, calling you, filling you with the fruit of the Spirit, filling you with the Spirit, gifting you accordingly as He desires, as He wills, not as we determine or not as we test or, or, or not as we drive or need or, or, or push, but instead, what's the Holy Spirit saying to you through the Word of God? That you would do that. We're entrusting you with that. That's our mission. That's the strategy of ministry. And when you read this, this is what has been the calling of the church throughout church history. This is why we're still standing. Right? And I think that, again, the, the church itself still standing. 
The word of God still going out, changing lives, the gospel saving people, lives radically transformed, people transformed by the word of God. This, for me, is one of the strongest evidences, reasons, arguments even, us, that you would believe. Because after all the attack, all the mocking, all the rejection, all the times that the, the, the word of God or the church itself has been proclaimed dead, worthless, irrelevant, gone, uh, you know, all those kind of, the, all the ways that we've been buried by the world. And here we are, still, still rocking it. It's just, uh, you, you look at this, and you look at what Christ has done. You stop and you read this. So understand me, the power is not in Paul. The power is not in some kind of significant chain line of apostles handing it off. No, the power is in the Word of God and the Holy Spirit working in you. And, and here's what I know, that God can do above and beyond all I could ever ask or imagine when we just simply let him be. <laughs> let him work through his word in your life. That's what we've done. You read this, and, and that's what our heart has been. And it's a rather simple mentality. It's not that it's easy, because there are a lot of challenges in this. Uh, but to note that the, 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 the uh, f- philosophy of this is simple. Again, verse 2, And these things you've heard from me among many witnesses, Commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And look at what God has done. Look at this little tiny church in all the places that we've reached. You know, no strategy, no scheme of men that could come up with this. Planting a church in Ottawa, seeing missions in uh, Eswatini in Swaziland, seeing missions in Kenya, seeing God use those in powerful ways, seeing church plants uh, in, in Crystal River now with Stephen, uh, seeing uh, people within this fellowship raised up, uh, people that, honestly, that we, we could have never found on our own uh, and wouldn't have recognized it if it slapped us in the face. You know, where, where do, do all the effective that leaders of home fellowships and ministries and the missions that have gone out and the churches, where does that all come from? It is because the Holy Spirit has taken this to task and he's been faithful to it. Jesus builds the church and I guarantee you, he's the best one at it. And no one else can build like he's the, he's the builder and you watch him work and it's stunning. You just sit back and go, ah, oh, this is a privilege and an honor to, to serve him, to be an under-shepherd to the shepherd. That's the privilege of this. So you read that, and, and th- there's that sense here that confirmation, encouragement, but you stop and you personalize this, and can I direct this, not to be heavy-handed, but honest with you, can I direct this to your heart right now? Uh, hear the calling of this. Faithful men, able to teach. And you can sense that in the body of Christ and the importance of men. You can sense the ways that women are part of this as well. But as you look at this, note this for yourself personally. Is God calling you? He is definitely calling you. What is he calling you to is the better question. What is he calling you to? Listen, within our midst, there are pastors on the horizon. There are, and not just in our youth group. (laughs) But as well, some of these, Timothy's, you know, young in ministry, he's 40. Right? Pastor Chuck Smith, he didn't start Calvary Chapel. He was pastoring in ministry, but he didn't start Calvary Chapel until he was in his 40s. And look what God did. Listen, there are things that God, and maybe it's pastoring, but maybe it's not. Maybe it's missions. Maybe it's uh, other aspects in our community. Maybe it's reaching out to the nursing homes. Maybe it's uh, you're reaching out to your neighbor. Maybe it's a, a person that, that has prayer ministry and commits himself to that. Uh, but all of us are called, and we're expecting that. We're looking to commit these things to faithful people, faithful men, faithful women. We're looking for the Holy Spirit to work and move. Let's see ministry expand. Let's see Christ build this uh, church through us and with us. That's the calling of this. It should stir a hope in your heart. Uh, And and honestly, uh, uh, you should look at me and go, if he can do it. That's one of the things that blessed me with Calvary Chapel. Uh, Being around Calvary Chapel early on, I was like, I can do this. I can do that. Uh, This isn't that big. You know, because so often we're presented with, if you want to be in ministry, you got to go to uh, eight years of seminary, you got a PhD and a div and a, you know, and all these letters behind your name, and and, uh, we'll see you in 20 years. I hope you make it. (laughs) Hey, 
If God's called you to that form and route, that's fine. But understand this. Uh, the guys that wrote the Bible didn't have all that. They were simple men. And uh, <laughs> I think there's a sim- something about that, a willingness to step in and trust the Lord. Uh, if he takes you on the path of a seminary, God bless you. Uh, but if he takes you another route, God bless you. Let's see the Lord work. And that's what we've been trusting uh, this work to. Uh, understand that verse. Underline that. <laughs> come back to that and let it stir your heart with the work of the Lord in your life personally. The work's not done. Uh, the harvest is ripe. The workers are few. Here's been our, this is what the Lord says. You pray because of that, because the harvest is ripe. You pray to the Lord for the workers. So church, let's pray for the workers. And understand this, while you're praying for the workers, it might be you. No, no, no let me back up. It is you. <laughs> so that has been a faithful part of our prayer life here at this church. The leadership, the pastors, the staff, the, the leaders of this, elders of this church, we have, we have prayed that often. Lord, the harvest is ripe. We're praying to you for the workers to bring in the harvest. Uh, there's still time. We still need help. The Lord's on the move. Well, we continue, verse 3. Move and ride along. Verse 3. You, therefore, must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Not easy. The Christian walk, ministry, not easy. Uh, battle is real. Uh, the casualties are around us. We see... Uh, hurt. We see the pain. We see the difficulties, uh, not only that we deal with in people's lives, trying to minister, trying to share the love of God, but also just in the sense of ministry, uh, in the, uh, the battle it is for pastors, for people in ministry, uh, the men that have stepped off the battlefield, the casualties. Uh, I've been at this for quite some time now, and uh, I, it, it, it hurts to reflect on those places, uh, the hardship of the battle. You note this, what Paul says here, you therefore must endure, must endure hardship. But what a word for us in this moment, uh, what a, a challenge for us in this moment. Uh, recognize again, the beginning of this, you be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Uh, this isn't in your own strength, this is continuing in that grace. You must endure Hardship. Do you hear that? Uh, you know, there's much that we could dis- discuss on this. The, uh, the parables of the sower, the different types of seed, and the way they react to, uh, to the challenges of life, or, or it, w- when we just look at our experience in ministry. Uh, listen, there are a lot of people that, that come and uh, commit themselves and give passionate uh, testimony. Uh, and they're gone in a week. Uh, a change of wind, <laughs> uh, you know, and they're out. You know, the, the, listen, the, the Christian life is not going to be easy. You don't want it to be easy. There's a sense here of the value of it. There's a sense here, and, and the way I've described this in the past is that the people that are on the battlefield will have the stories of victory from the war. Right, the, the people that, uh, the, the, the guys that played in the Super Bowl uh, and won the championship, uh, or even lost the championship, they will describe that game in detail and talk about the battles in that field and the things that they went through with such drama and such a personal connection that a fan will never have. Listen, Christian, you're called to the field. You're called to be in the game. You're called to the battlefield. The battle we're in right now, the war has been won, but the battle right now is for the heart of the individuals, heart of the the people around us to to get saved, to bring them to Christ, uh, to point them to Jesus. That's the battle. You must endure hardship. We are not called to be uh, uh, quick, quick to quit. Uh, we are not called to have shallow commitment, shallow, co- shallow considerations. It is too often that the Christian testimony uh, of the church is filled with people that go, oh, you know, I started doing, and fill in the blank, teaching Sunday school, uh, homeless outreach, prison minute. But then in a little bit of resistance, a little bit of opposition, and boom, out. Right? I didn't get a bunch of pats on the back. Nobody thanked me. Nobody paid attention. And boom, out. No, listen, Christian, Christian, listen, 
<laughs> We're not here to, uh, to uh, make it, you know, uh, some kind of flowery, uh, tiptoe, easy, nursery school experience. Uh, listen, there's a, an enemy out there, and there's a real fight out there, and you need to be prepared for the reality. And that's why Paul says, you must endure hardship. Again, how that speaks to us right now. Think of the soldier and the sacrifices the soldier makes, the, uh, the equipping that the soldier goes through, the, uh, the, the uh, diligence, the, uh, the, the uh, call to uh, be on and, and ready at any moment to go to battle. You know, that, uh, the sense of the, uh, the uh, uh, suffering, the sa- self-sacrifice that he lays out there uh, to be a good soldier. Uh, a, a good soldier uh, is n- never in a place where he's not ready for the battle. He's, a good soldier is never in a place where he's not equipped and, and prepared, trained and ready, focused and, and, and geared up for those things. A good soldier, you must therefore endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare not, this isn't a time of ease and of peace. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life. There is nothing more important. Uh, and how easily distracted we become. And I am guilty of this. And this time that we're in right now has really brought this to light in my personal life. I pray that God is speaking to your heart on these things as well. Have we been uh, playing around when there's a battle going on? Uh, the, the, I said this last week. The, the church, this isn't a playground. This is a battlefield. Uh, are we aware of what's going on? And have we allowed ourselves to be distracted with the, the frailties of this world, uh, the empty, shallow promises of this world. Have we been allow- allowing ourselves to be distracted with what's on Netflix this week uh, versus, hey, uh, how can we pray? Who can we reach for the Lord? How am I living for the Lord? Is that even something appropriate for me to watch? You know, all those things. Are we aware of what's going on? Listen, no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life. Now, we're not talking about the practical things and you you need to work and you need to be a good employee and you need to provide for your family and the things that are common sense responsibilities, Uh, but you understand the ways that we begin to live for this world and not for the Lord. This life is a brief vapor. If we try to put our hope in this life, it is foolish. Uh, We have eternity set before us. Uh, we are called to live, to, to invest in the kingdom of God, to store up treasures in heaven. Uh, that's our calling. Uh, as you continue with this, he says, Nobody entangles themselves in the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. Uh, this is the Lord, right? We, we are doing this, uh, and, and let me be clear on this. We're doing this not out of duty because the man upstairs makes us do it, Now we're doing this because our Savior, Jesus Christ, has called us to this. And we get to where our response and our reason, our motivation, is because we love him. Because of all that he's done for us, we love him because he first loved us. This is why, this is our motivation. This is why we want to uh, live this out with a passion. Uh, we want to do this because he has loved us so much, and we want to respond to his love by loving him, living for him. That's the sense of this. It continues in verse 5, and he gives a transition to another example. And also, if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned. He doesn't get the, the, you know, the, the trophy or the blue ribbon. He doesn't get that unless he competed in, according to the rules. Now, how often have we seen this you know, with different athletes uh, getting caught later on cheating, uh, getting caught later on not playing by the rules, and they get stripped of their gold medals or their records or their, you know, the reward. They get stripped of those things. And how embarrassing that is, right? Uh, so w- 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 here we are as an athlete, recognize, listen, y- you know the game you're playing? 
Do you know the sport that you're playing? I don't want to mix metaphors there and confuse you. Listen, now we're in the athlete, and the athlete there on the field competing. You need to know the game that you're playing, right? The sport that you're in, right? You don't want to go to play football and find out that it's a soccer match, right? You want to be geared up for the game that you're in. You know, what's the right way to live? And are you living according to the rules? There are certain things uh, that an athlete does to understand and to, to be informed and to be equipped and to be trained. There's a lot of sacrifice in this. He'll even adjust his diet. He'll adjust his sleep schedule. He'll wear the right attire. Uh, he'll be uh, educated and informed in the rules that he needs to, be, uh, to play by and to compete in. Uh, all of those things. And any athlete that doesn't know that, doesn't know those things, uh, he's counted as a fool. Uh, if you've ever seen uh, you know, an athlete uh, uh, running a race and they end up off course or uh, you know, they think it's okay to do this or that, uh, it's an embarrassment. They're disqualified. Now, the, the sense of this is not, uh, as Paul would talk about this in other situations, the disqualifications are not that we would lose our salvation but that you would miss out on the reward. Because <laughs> you, you never read the word. You didn't figure out what it meant to, uh, to live for the Lord. In Ephesians, Paul would say it this way. Find out what pleases God. Find out what his will is. You ask, you read, you study. You ser- ser- seek the Lord in that. Uh, who runs a race and doesn't even know where the finish line is? Doesn't even know what the appropriate... Have you ever seen those people that run a marathon and they jump in a cab? What were they thinking? Listen, Christian, there's no coasting in this. Well, I need to move on. You note this about both the soldier and the athlete, uh, the self-sacrifice, the commitment, the sense of this need to endure, the sense of um, uh, even uh, face in the face of hardship, They're called to these things. The last one is the farmer. Verse 6, the hardworking farmer must be first to partake in the crops. Consider what I say, and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. Now, as you read this, it's interesting that he brings up the farmer, and he he, uh, doesn't really uh, say much about him. Now, all he says about him is that he must first be first to partake of the crops. Now, I think there's two ways that the Lord's speaking to us in this, and I'll give these for your consideration. The first is, I think there's a sense here that the farmer gets to enjoy the first portions of the harvest, right? He gets to partake in the things that he's planted and worked for. He's the first one that it's on his table, right? There's a sense of reward. There's a sense of blessing in this, and I think that's right and fitting you know there's a sense that he partakes Uh, but the other part of this is deeper than that and and i think this speaks of ministry and and let me personalize it and just approach it to you uh, from the perspective of a pastor i think as a pastor is is a pastor as i am called to study the word and to prepare and to consider uh, communicating these things to you it first must go through me it has to affect me if it doesn't, I'm just, you know, regurgitating isn't even the appropriate term. I'm just kind of uh, letting information bounce off of me and onto you and never affecting me, never changing. I have to be first in line to take these things in and allow them to speak to my heart. I have to be affected by this. If it hasn't affected me, how is it going to affect you? Uh, it, only by God's grace. In all of that, I, I want to be a part of this, and I want you to recognize this. Here's my, the sense of this. Never trust a skinny cook, right? If you see a skinny chef, don't you just kind of like go, nah, what's good? Right? Because, listen, if, if somebody's cooking it up for you, and they're not partaking, and they're not enjoying, just how good can it be? I've had to laugh at people come up to me, and, and they mean this as a compliment, uh, but I've had people come up to me after a service or something like that, and they'll say something, you really believe this stuff? I was like, yes, I do. Right? There's a sense that you, this isn't worked up fake emotions. This is really affecting me. Uh, you need to understand that, right? 
in the, the sense of this. Look at what the farmer goes through. He gets up early. He works day after day in the monotony of the work. He watches out for the pestilence and the, the bugs and the pests that will take over the, the crop. He guards against those things. He works the field. He, all the things that he goes through day after day with seemingly very little response, and then all of a sudden the fruit takes place. Uh, I saw a new word this week, fructify. There's actually that, that, that sense. Look it up. Jim's looking at me like I'm crazy. Fructify, it's, it's, it's to bring fruitfulness uh, to a place that it was not fruitful. Uh, the sense of that, right, uh, the, the privilege of that, uh, note all the things that a farmer will go through. And why does he do it? Day after day, getting up early, the monotony, the drain, uh, the boring, the, the lack of result, all that. Why does he do it? Because he knows there's a harvest. That's why he continues, and it's true in all of these things. Why does the soldier do what he, because he knows there's victory. Why does the athlete do what he does? Why does it, all the self-sacrifice, all this endurance, putting up with hardship and continuing on, uh, uh, remaining strong in the grace of Christ, why do we do it? Because we know there's victory. We know there's a harvest. We know soon and very soon, not only will we see him face to face, but we'll receive reward for the things we've done for him. We'll be in that place, and we'll receive blessing and reward. We'll hear, well done, good and faithful servant. But, but let me say this. There will be some that arrive smelling of smoke, uh, barely saved by the skin of their teeth, uh, have not invested in the kingdom of heaven. Listen, Christian, you're called, you're invited to be a part of this. But there is the potential. And there are those that will arrive. And they have sent very little ahead. Uh, they have a simple salvation in Christ, but they didn't live for him. Listen, Christian, understand what you've been called to. You must endure hardship. You must be the good soldier. You must be the athlete that's running in the right race, uh, running in appropriate fashion. You must be the farmer that partakes in the harvest. Now, We'll close this up. I wanted to get a little bit further, but we're not going to be able to make it. But I, I, I want to close it up with verse 7. And uh, verse 7, uh, interesting verse, right? And I want you to uh, highlight and underline and come back to this. and Come back to these verses this week and reread and invite the Holy Spirit. And then read ahead and ask the Holy Spirit to teach you and to counsel you. Uh, let's be a people that purify before the Lord especially in the season. Look at verse 7. It says, consider what I say. Think about it. Invite the Holy Spirit, right, to illuminate, to educate, to encourage you, to train you, to uh, connect the dots, to give you revelation, to give you understanding, personal application. Invite the work of the Holy Spirit through these scriptures. Uh, let it move you forward in the midst of this time. Uh, the, the things that we've discussed tonight uh, I'm sorry, today, uh, are simple. Uh, they're not necessarily complex in their display or, or their communication, uh, but they are far-reaching in teaching and training us and, f and things that we must consider, marinate, break down, uh, have on your mind, uh, you know, weigh it out, ask the Lord to give you understanding, look at each word and uh, the explanations around it. Just uh, let it really speak to your heart. Let it be alive and active. Consider what I say, and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. Now, some of the translations imply that all things in a broad spectrum of uh, literally like just the entirety of life, uh, and there's always the sense of that with God's wisdom. Uh, but there's also a sense that some of the translations look at this and, th and they say that, that you would have understanding in these things, right? In all the things that we just discussed. And I think there's weight for both of those. And, uh, and you just stop with that last verse. And what a prayer for us, right? And here's your homework. Here's what you've been called to. This is the church's call to action uh, this week right here. Consider what the Lord has said through Paul. Right here in this uh, small section of 2 Timothy chapter 2, you let it weigh in your mind. Invite the work of the Holy Spirit. Ruminate, break it down, marinate, uh, uh, 
uh, digest it, uh, really uh, let it unfold, invite the Holy Spirit to do that. And you notice, you're called to think about it, but then it says, and may the Lord give. Oh, how gracious, <laughs> how generous. The, the insight that the Lord has <laughs> on the word of God is amazing. It's just amazing the things expressed to you in those moments where, you know, you've offered it up to the Lord, you've been thinking about it, and you're going throughout your day, and then boom, the light goes on, and it's like, oh, wow. So personal, so powerful, so important, so relevant. Can you consider, but then let's ask the Lord, and this is, this is Paul's prayer for Timothy. It's my prayer for you. It's my continuing prayer for you, that the Lord would give you Understanding. Understanding in all things. That you would know. That you would get it. Revelation. Clarity. <laughs> that you would be strong in the grace of Jesus Christ. <laughs> that you would be that good soldier. That competitive athlete. That hardworking farmer. The harvest is coming. It's a call to action. Let's pray. Well, I'm going to pray and uh, ask the Lord to speak into your heart, and uh, especially in this season and this time. And then as I close in prayer, our video will end, but your prayer should not. So I'm asking you to continue to pray about this. Here in this moment of watching, take some time, and maybe you're with others and you can pray with others right now. Uh, you can talk about these things uh, definitely with the Lord to, today, right now. Take some time, a uh, few minutes right now to pray over these things, invite the work of the Holy Spirit, and then continue that conversation and come back to these passages and reread and invite the Holy Spirit to stir your heart and, and ready you in his, the strength of his grace. Ask for those things. Uh, talk about this this week. Connect with one another email, phone calls, Zoom, whatever it might be, talk about these things. Talk about what the Lord's doing in your life, how he spoke to you in the half day of prayer. Encourage people in this. Let's pray for these things. Father, we look at this, and right now, Lord, there's just a sense that we recognize this, uh, this word, your truth, your scripture, uh, the things spoken here uh, in this text, but the, the whole of your word, it is honey to our lips. Lord, it is water to dry ground. Lord, there's just a sense that we recognize this. We have uh, relied on the junk food of the world, and we thought we were satisfied, but we have not been. It's very apparent right now, Lord, as we drink in from your word, there's just the sense of this. Lord, this is, this is honey from the rock. Lord, this is your sustaining truth. This is what we need. Lord, wet our appetites with this. Give us a hunger and a thirst for more. Move by your Holy Spirit and bring revival, a sanctification, bring discipleship. Lord, you build your church. Lord, even in these strange, isolated times, we're asking you to do far more than we could ever ask or imagine, more effective than we could have done when we were meeting in a building. Lord, let there be a move of your spirit that brings revival that surprises even the church. Lord, Lord but definitely the world. Lord, we're praying for you to stir uh, your spirit in the church, uh, especially our fellowship with these things from Timothy, uh, Lord, and stir in us in such a powerful way, Lord, that we would be vessels ready for your use uh, to reach this world, to represent Christ, to bring the truth of his love, his grace, and his mercy uh, to the world around us. Lord, let us be your ambassadors. Plead through us. By your Holy Spirit, uh, through the reality and victory of Jesus Christ, we pray these things in his name. Amen.